Good evening. Um, we're pleased to welcome you here tonight uh, to hear from Ambassador uh, William Burns and uh, Samantha Vinograd uh, and a conversation on the Ambassador's new book, The Back Channel, A Memoir of American Diplomacy and the Case for Its Renewal. And I just have to take a point of personal privilege. One of the great joys of serving in government is you get a chance to work with remarkable people who are committed, who are talented, and who are, uh, who are willing to devote those talents uh, to the country. I, I can't think of anyone who exemplifies that value more than, than Bill Burns. Uh, in my years in Washington, I, I never met anyone who impressed me more, uh, in part because he's as humble as he is smart, and because there was never a question about, uh, about his, uh, his commitment to the country and to, um, and to the craft of diplomacy. So I'm excited that he's here. Uh, I've read his book. I urge all of you to buy it. Uh, it'll be available uh, after, and he will sign them. And, and Sam is uh, an example of the great young people who are attracted to government and service and could be doing other things and devote themselves instead to, in this case, national security and keeping our country safe. And she's now a wonderful commentator on, uh, on CNN. So it's good to see both of you. Uh, tomorrow night, I'll be uh, recording a live podcast with Jason Rezian of the Washington Post, talking about uh, his books and his 544 days uh, uh, in prison in Iran uh, and that ordeal, as well as the plight of journalists uh, generally in a very dangerous world. Next Tuesday, uh, former U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security Janet Napolitano will be visiting to discuss her new book uh, on national security policy since 9-11. And on May 14th, Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey and former Secretary of Transportation Ray LaHood will be in conversation about the state or uh, the state of, I guess this is a euphemism, the state of U.S. infrastructure. Um, but uh, an important discussion. You can find out more about all of our upcoming events on our website at politics.uchicago.edu. Uh, we'll open the floor uh, to take questions from the audience. Please line up behind the microphone in the center aisle. And remember, uh, everyone is welcome at the mic. As usual, though, we'll give priority to the first three questions uh, to our students. And as always, a question ends in a question mark. Um, please make sure your phones are on silent. Uh, the restrooms uh, are downstairs. And here uh, to formally introduce our speakers uh, is Dylan Stafford. Dylan is a third year f a student from Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's studying political science and history. Um, and uh, during his time at the IOP, he has served as a speaker series intern. And this year, he is the indispensable a junior chair on our student advisory board, just an incredible, uh, an incredible gift to us at the IOP. And this summer, he's headed to Iowa along with uh, 59 or 60 of uh, his uh, fellow students to be part of our Iowa project, working on campaigns and on campaign coverage uh, in Iowa. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dylan. David touched on it. Um, thanks all. Um, in 1982, William Burns joined the Foreign Service, fresh off completion of a bachelor's in history from LaSalle University and a master's and doctorate in international relations from Oxford. In the 33 years that followed, Burns served at the highest levels of the United States Diplomatic Corps, earning a reputation for himself as one of the nation's most capable and determined diplomats. By the time he retired from the State Department in 2014, after all note, delaying his retirement twice at the request of Secretary Kerry and then President Obama, Secretary Kerry proclaimed that Burns had, quote, more than earned his place on a very short list of American diplomatic legends. Earlier in, in his career at State, he served on the National Security Council and the State Department uh, policy planning staff. He was special assistant to both uh, President Clinton's secretaries of state then became U.S. Ambassador to Jordan, an Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, then the U.S. Ambassador to Russia, and eventually landed as Deputy Secretary of State under President Obama. As the only the second career ambassador uh, in history to become a Deputy Secretary of State, Ambassador Burns was a key player 
in many of the most important foreign policy decisions of the last few decades. He led, for example, the secret talks with the Iranians, which of course eventually culminated in the Iranian nuclear deal. In short, Ambassador Burns seems to know a, few, a thing or two about diplomacy, um, and we are so excited to have him join us here now as the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace to discuss his new book. Um, and of course, we're lucky to have Sam, Sam Vinograd, a rock star in her own right, to moderate tonight's discussion. Uh, as David said, she's a national security analyst for CNN. She's a senior advisor for the Bi Penn Biden Institute. Um, and she served in top positions on the National Security Council, including as senior advisor to the National Security Advisor. Lots of senior advisors. Um, so with that, yeah, please join me in welcoming tonight's phenomenal guests. Thanks. Thank you so much. And David, thank you for having us. Uh, Bill, I just want to echo something that David said, which is to thank you for your service. As a young NSC staffer, Ambassador Burns' reputation was he was who to call when we had a problem. There was nothing that Ambassador Burns couldn't do, and you taught so many of us, and were a mentor and friend to so many of us. And your book continues to do that. It really lays out lessons for all of those that are still engaged in diplomacy or seeking to get involved in diplomacy. And I must say that we spent most of our time together in the windowless situation room. So in so many ways, it's so much better to be here at the University of Chicago with you. And before we dive into specific episodes or lessons, sure. let's go macro. What is diplomacy? Well, good place to start. First, it's great to be with you, Sam, on stage. It brings back lots of good memories and really wonderful to be with all of you here in Chicago. Um, you know, diplomacy in its most basic form is how you promote American interests on an international landscape by means short of force. It's not, you know, an instrument of national security that's isolated from military leverage or economic leverage. What you try to do is harness that. Um, but diplomacy ought to be the tool of first resort, given our experience over the years in different administrations of either the premature use or the overuse of the U.S. military, by far the most formidable in the world, and the cost in blood and treasure to Americans that comes from that when you don't at least explore first you know, what you can achieve with your tool of first resort diplomacy. When I was reading your book, I was struck by one of your, I think it was your first uh, posting, was it Jordan? In Jordan. Uh -huh. When uh, you take on a very sexy diplomatic role, which was to drive a truck uh, carrying supplies that ended up getting stopped by Iraqi security officials. And you really lay out the different things that diplomats do other than engage in negotiations. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, I mean, diplomats and embassies and consulates overseas aren't always engaged in the sort of high diplomacy, the dramatic dealings with senior foreign leaders. I mean, that sometimes happens. But what you're also doing is everything from looking after Americans who get in trouble overseas, who get imprisoned or lose their passports. You're issuing visas to you know, foreign citizens who want to come to the United States, whether it's to study or just to visit as tourists. Um, you know, you get engaged in a whole range of functions trying to promote American business overseas to try to ensure a level playing field for American businesses that are trying to invest, to try to attract foreign investors to the United States. So, you know, it's a whole diversity of, of skills that you have to bring to the challenge. And based on all that, you served under 10 secretaries of state? I did, yeah. yeah. What was, what was the peak of U.S. diplomacy? We'll come back to where we are today, but yeah. what would you say was the peak? Well, in my experience, you know, I entered the Foreign Service at the beginning of 1982, so the height of the Cold War. And you know, in many ways, it was the end of the Cold War. You know, when I worked in the George H.W. Bush administration for Secretary of State Baker, that in my experience, at least, was the peak of American power and diplomacy because you had an intersection of a really plastic moment on the international landscape, some profound transformations occurring. The, the kind of moments that come along maybe twice a century in the history of American foreign policy, it happened after the Second World War, 1945, happened in 1989, and we can get to this, but I would argue that today's landscape reflects that same set of transformations. But what made that period in the Bush 41 administration unique in my experience was the intersection of these profound transformations, a moment when the United States was the singular dominant player on the international landscape, intersecting with a group of American statesmen in George H.W. Bush and Secretary Baker, Brent Scowcroft was then the National Security Advisor, who were um, unusually skilled in their understanding of that landscape and their 
capacity to work together, even though they disagreed, you know, sometimes. Um, but it, we were really blessed, I think, as a country at that moment to have this group of statesmen. And I, I learned a lot from that period. And I don't know if Moscow is the capital that you spent the most time in uh, outside of this country, but you did two tours there, I believe. I did, yeah. Both, most uh, of my gray hair came from that <laughs> yeah. experience, yeah. I don't, I don't blame you. So Russia is obviously a country that's on a lot of our minds today, particularly after mm -hmm. watching the hearing. Let's dial it back, though. What did we get wrong and what did we get right during the Cold War transition? Um, well, you know, there was a big debate in the late 1990s about who lost Russia, you know, as Russia was beginning even then to take an authoritarian turn. I always thought that was the wrong question. I mean, you know, Russia was never ours to lose as Americans. But the truth is, I think we and the Russians had our own illusions over the quarter century or more after the end of the Cold War. And I've always thought that if you want to understand the smoldering aggressiveness of Vladimir Putin's Russia, it helps to understand the chaos of the, the disorder, the mix of hope and humiliation that I saw in Boris Yeltsin's Russia when I first served there in the early 1990s. It was a Russia that was flat on its back economically. And you know, Russia is a huge landscape across 11 time zones. I remember President Obama, for whom I have huge regard, um, once commented kind of dismissively on Russia that it was just a regional power. And my reaction to that was it's a pretty goddamn big region. <laughs> um, and, and it was a kaleidoscope of experiences in the 90s. I remember going to Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, in the winter of 1994-95, the first Chechen war. Um, and you know the, the center of Grozny um, was flattened. There were 40 square blocks that looked like pictures you see of Dresden 1945. The Russian general who was responsible for that said his goal was to make the rubble bounce. And most of the civilians who were killed there were elderly Russian, ethnic Russian pensioners who just couldn't get out. So this was you know, as grim a situation as I've seen, but driving into Chechnya in that period, you, know, you saw the Red Army, which was supposed at the height of the Cold War to be able to get to the English Channel in 48 hours, that looked like a street gang. Now, albeit a nuclear armed street gang. But you know, they were having a huge difficulty suppressing a local rebellion in an isolated part of Russia. So, you know, for Vladimir Putin, you know, when he became Russia's leader um, almost 20 years ago now, um, you know, that that's the memory that was seared in him, a moment when, in his view, the United States and the West in general had taken advantage of Russia's moment of historical weakness. I'm not trying to justify that view because I think it's mostly ill-founded, although we made mistakes in that period too. But that's what animated him. Um, I still remember the first time I met Putin as the newly arrived American ambassador in Russia in the summer of 2005. And yet the first meeting took place in the Kremlin, which is built on a scale that's meant to intimidate foreigners or visitors, especially new American ambassadors. So you walk through these huge ornate halls down long corridors. I mean, you come to the end of one huge hall, and there are these two-story bronze doors. And you're kept waiting there for a minute just to let all this sink in. And then the door cracks open, and out comes Vladimir Putin, who, you know, despite his bare-chested persona, is not that intimidating in person. He's about 5'6", but he carries himself with great self-assurance. So he comes walking toward me before I got a word out of my mouth. He said, you Americans need to listen more. You can't have everything your own way anymore. We can have effective relations, but not just on your terms. That was vintage Putin. It was not subtle. It was kind of defiantly charmless. But the message was Russia was going to push back. And so Putin tended to connect the dots, whether they were meant to be connected or not and saw a pattern of the United States trying to keep Russia down. Um, that was his conviction, but it was also convenient because he could use that, the American enemy at the gate, to justify political repression at home, too. So it's a long-witted answer from a recovering diplomat, but I really do think that you, you, know, you do have to understand that kind of arc of history. And you asked whether we made mistakes. Um, Russians made mistakes. I think you know Putin operates under the illusion that you know a, a very authoritarian political system with a one-dimensional economy and a struggling demographic reality is going to be an effective basis to compete in the 21st century. And I, I think that's an illusion. But we had our illusions too. 
you know, in the 1990s, the truth was because Russia was so weak, we could maneuver over or around Russian leaderships. On the issue of NATO expansion, for example, I never thought, even though I think we underestimated the eventual Russian reaction to the first two waves of NATO expansion in the late 1990s and then early in the 2000s, and Central and Eastern Europe and then the Baltic states. I don't think that did lethal damage to US-Russian relations. Where I do think we made a mistake was towards the end of my time as ambassador in the spring of 2008, when we pushed hard to formally open the doors to membership in NATO for Ukraine and Georgia. And I always hate the term red line, but you know that was the reddest of red lines, not just for Putin, but for the Russian political elite. So that did not in any way justify Putin's later aggression against Georgia in 2008, against Ukraine in 2014, but it fed his narrative of the United States determined to keep Russia down. Ambassador, when we worked together in government, Medvedev was in office first. He was replaced by Putin. And now we have a situation where Putin could hang on for the foreseeable future if changes to the Constitution continue. Yeah. All that's happening. And we have the Mueller report, Barr testimony, 2020 election, all that playing out before our eyes. How do you think that's being perceived in Moscow? How do you think Putin is reacting to the state of American influence today? Well, I think it suits him just fine. I mean, in the sense that, you know, from Putin's point of view, uh, sure, he'd like an American administration and an American Congress who would relax the sanctions that, you know, were imposed on Russia for a number of reasons, starting in Ukraine in 2014. But I think second best for him is a dysfunctional American political system and erratic American leadership that creates space for Russia on the international landscape as a, as a major power. I mean, you, you remember the scene of President Trump and President Putin on stage after they had their summit meeting in Helsinki last summer, um, in which the president, I think in an effort to ingratiate himself with Putin, basically threw 17 US intelligence and law enforcement agencies under the bus. I think Putin saw that effort to ingratiate um, as a mark of weakness and manipulability. I think if you could have you know, looked at the cartoon balloon coming out of Putin's head as he looked at President Trump, it would have, been, it would have said, what an easy mark. Um, and so I think as he looks at the, he doesn't look at all the ins and outs of the Mueller investigation or congressional hearings, but I think he sees this as you know, a sign of disarray in the United States, of distraction of erratic leadership, and you know that creates opportunities for Russia. Well, one of the issues that you work closely with Russia on, we work closely with Russia on, was Iran. Mm -hmm. And uh, that culminated, of course, in the nuclear arrangement that, it, that Russia ended up being helpful on. You write elsewhere in the book that diplomacy is often the accumulation of partial successes. Can we apply that to your experience with the Iran nuclear deal? Sure. Was it an accumulation of partial successes? How did you get from where we were in 2009 when we discovered a covert Iranian mm -hmm. nuclear site to signing that deal? Well, I mean, you know, U.S.-Iranian relations over the course of my whole career, I took the exam, the written exam for the Foreign Service at our old embassy in London the same week that, you know, my future embassy colleagues were taken hostage in Tehran. And so over the whole arc of my career through the terrible Iranian-backed bombings of the American embassy in Beirut, of the Marine barracks, the Iranians have their own list of grievances. You know, that relationship became a minefield and nobody had a good map. I, I became convinced, you know, as I got to more senior positions in the State Department, starting at the end of the Bush administration in 2008, that it was important to test whether or not diplomacy could actually produce results on what was the most imminent threat of many threats that this theocratic Iranian regime poses to our interests, the interests of our friends in the Middle East. And that was an unconstrained nuclear program. Um, and so, especially under President Obama, um, who was willing to make, take a you know, much more ambitious approach to the Iranians diplomatically, you know, we began a pretty serious effort. First, to test whether the Iranians were serious about negotiations. But then when it became clear, when we dealt with them directly in 2009 and beyond, that the Iranians weren't at that point prepared for a serious negotiation to really constrain and allow us to verify their nuclear, their civilian nuclear program, we used that as an investment. 
um, in building a coalition of countries, including some like Russia and China, that you know, contained their enthusiasm for sanctions against Iran or anybody else. But we used our demonstration that we weren't the problem. We were willing to negotiate directly with Iran as a way of building greater economic politi and political pressure against the Iranians. So you fast forward to the beginning of uh, President Obama's second term in 2013. Iran's oil exports had dropped by 50%. The value of its currency had dropped by 50%. But it wasn't pressure just for the sake of pressure. We were willing to engage. And I think President Obama made the right decision to do that secretly at first. You know, we had gone 35 years without sustained diplomatic contact with the Iranians. And I'm convinced to this day that if we had tried to do this in the glare of public scrutiny, um, it would have gotten blown up on the launch pad. So we spent most of 2013 in a series of nine or 10 separate sessions with the Iranians. As, as you remember, Sam, it was a very closely held secret in the, in the US government. You know, the closest held secret I knew other than the bin Laden mm -hmm. you know, raid, which had taken place a little bit before. Um, and that was also necessary in order to preserve the effort. But we made faster progress than I expected we'd make. And by the end of November 2013, we had put together the, you know, essentially an interim agreement, which froze the Iranian nuclear program, rolled it back in some significant respects, imposed quite intrusive verification and monitoring procedures, all in return for very modest sanctions relief, because we wanted to preserve most of the leverage for the later comprehensive talks that Secretary Kerry led. So was it a perfect solution? No, but perfect's rarely on the menu in diplomacy. It still left us, it was the best of the available alternatives in my view for preventing the Iranians from developing a nuclear weapon. We still face the challenge of threatening Iranian behavior, their efforts to subvert their neighbors in the Middle East, which we had to deal with. I just thought there was a smart way and a dumb way to deal with that. The smart way, in my view anyway, was to reduce one layer of risk, which was the Iranian nuclear program, um, and then use that as a foundation to mobilize other countries to push back against the Iranians in other areas. And that's why I worry about you know, President Trump's decision to pull out of that agreement. I was gonna ask you about that. As, as a, if you were sitting in the State Department right now, how likely is it that Iran would be open, open to meeting any of the points that Secretary of Pompeo laid out in his 12-step plan for Iran Having reneged on the Iran deal, having withdrawn from it, is there any diplomatic opening that you foresee with Iran right now? Well, I mean, you know, there are always diplomatic openings, and I don't doubt the capacity of the United States, even with the unilateral reimposition of sanctions, you know, over the objections of our European allies and the Russians and Chinese, to impose significant economic damage on the, on the Iranians. And I think that's what's happening today. I, I worry, though, that the purpose of American strategy right now, like the 12 demands that Secretary Pompeo laid out publicly, which in effect sent a message to Tehran that when you become Sweden, give us a call. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're all legitimate aspirations to have, but I don't think they're realistic in the short term. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the danger right now is that the purpose of this strategy seems to be less a better nuclear deal and more producing either the capitulation of this theocratic regime in Tehran or its implosion. And I just don't think that either of those expectations are connected to history as I've understood it. Maximum pressure is fine as long as it's connected mm -hmm. to some real, realistic set of aims. Without that, you know, I think it can lead us in some dangerous directions. Collisions with the Iranians, which can escalate very rapidly. And in the meantime, you do a lot of collateral damage. You know, withdrawing from the Iranian nuclear agreement is part of a pattern of retreat from international agreements, the Paris Climate Agreement, the, you know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Big Global Trade Agreement in Asia. Um, I think we're also, and so that erodes our credibility mm -hmm. in the world. I think we're also widening the fissure between us and our closest European allies, in effect, doing Putin's work for him. Um, and I think we're also undermining the utility of sanctions as an instrument of American policy over time, too, because even the foreign minister of Germany, one of our closest allies a year ago, said publicly, all of us need to reduce our vulnerability to the US financial system. And so we'll wake up, not tomorrow, not next year, but five or six years from now, and sanctions will no longer mm 
be as an effective tool as it, as it once was, even though we sometimes overused and misused it. One of the other countries. Other than that, I think the yeah, decision to pull out right? was a great was a idea. Yeah. Yeah. One of the other countries and one of the other anecdotes that really struck me was the time that you spent with Qaddafi right before he decided to right. renounce his WMD and to renounce terrorism. That was a separate back channel. And you write that he was convinced that changing his behavior was in his own interest. How did you go about doing that? What convinced him that making these difficult changes was worthwhile for him and beneficial to him? Well, I mean, it was, I, in my view, a kind of classic example of when you can make diplomacy work. You know, Gaddafi was by far the most peculiar foreign <laughs> leader I ever dealt with. But, you know, we had built over a period of many years going back to the Bush 41 administration after the uh, Libyans were responsible for the shoot down of Pan Am Flight 103, which killed 270 people, including a friend of mine who, with whom I had served in the Middle East, was on his way back from Beirut to spend Christmas with his wife and two young daughters. So, you know, in all those hours I spent with Gaddafi and his senior advisors, I never forgot the blood that was on his hands. But, you know, after 9-11, with this pressure, economic sanctions, Security Council resolutions from the United Nations gradually building up against Gaddafi. After 9-11, I think he became a little bit anxious about you know, being on the wrong side of history at that point. Um, and we used that moment in a back-channel set of talks with the Libyans facilitated by the British um, you know, to basically persuade him first to take responsibility for the Lockerbie, the Pan Am 103, terrorist attack to get out of the business of terrorism and then to give up what was a rudimentary nuclear program. Um, and it was, a, it was a demonstration, ironically, at the same time that we were committing the tragic mistake of going to war with Iraq in 2003, in roughly the same time period, that actually you could make diplomacy work if you made clear that you had realistic aims. In other words, we made clear to Gaddafi this was not about regime change. Um, this was about changing his behavior on those critical issues of a nuclear program and terrorism. And you know, eventually, we applied enough international pressure, and we were willing to engage with him directly you know, such that it produced a result. But I do remember dealing with Gaddafi in this period. And um, he, you know, his, his favorite time for meeting was like 3 o'clock in the morning, which was not my favorite time to meet. And I remember on one occasion seeing him in a tent out in the middle of the Libyan desert, which is also a place that he preferred to meet. And you know, it, it you know, wasn't a very exotic setting. I mean, it was this kind of military canvas tent uh, furnished with plastic white lawn furniture as well. And then there's Gaddafi sitting across from you. And this meeting went on for like three or four hours. But he had this really disconcerting habit in the middle of the conversation of pausing and staring at the ceiling. Really? And I assume this was to collect his thoughts. But you know, I'm trained as a diplomat to carry on conversations. And so it puts you off a little bit. But he's also a flashy dresser. <laughs> so on this occasion, he was wearing what looked like a pajama top with photographs of dead African dictators on it. So I would spend the three or four minutes while he paused, and he did this a lot to try to guess how many of them I could identify. And, <laughs> and because he did this a lot, I got pretty good at it by the end of that conversation. But you know, I never forgot you know, his bloodily repressive streak. And you know, what we did was very transactional with Gaddafi. It suited American interests to strip him of a nuclear program and get him out of terrorism. But it didn't change the reality that sooner or later, I think his own people were going to get fed up with him. <laughs> Which they did, and it brings up the interesting point that when you negotiated that deal, we had not recently engaged in regime change. And you also mentioned Iraq, which happened right. after after this uh, this deal with Qaddafi, which is where I began my career. And you lay out in the book what went wrong internally within the U.S. government, and then what went wrong once we went into Iraq, and two crucial decisions that we made that really put the writing on the wall for the future of Iraq. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, I think a lot of things went wrong in that period. Um, it was by far the most painful chapter, you know, in my own three and a half decades as, a, as an American diplomat. And to this day, I regret that I didn't uh, make my concerns um, clearer or more effective about the run up to war. I mean, my colleagues and I in the Middle East Bureau of the State Department, which I led at the time working for Colin Powell, you know, had deep concerns about the rush to war. And, 
you know, one effort I remember in the summer of 2002, two colleagues of mine and I had the most depressing brainstorming session of our careers because we tried to lay out in a memorandum for Secretary Powell all the things we thought could go wrong the day after Saddam Hussein was toppled. Because I don't mean to minimize the military challenge, but I always thought the easy part would be the military overthrow of Saddam Hussein. The hard part was going to come in managing you know, a, a incredibly complicated society, all sorts of sectarian rifts and divisions the day after Saddam Hussein was toppled. So we tried to list all the things that we could go, thought could go wrong. It wasn't a really coherent memo, but it was an effort to puncture what we thought were the recklessly rosy assumptions of advocates. And Ambassador, how many of those did go wrong? We got it about half right, yeah. you know, and half we exaggerated or got things wrong too. But it was it was an honest effort, at least, to express our concerns. And I always found in any disciplined service in the U.S. government, you know, you have an obligation. You can choose to resign. And I had three of my colleagues in the State Department who resigned over uh, in the run up to the war with Iraq, and I had enormous respect for them. Um, there were two dozen of my colleagues who did that over the Balkans in the 1990s. A number you know, who have resigned in this era, in mm -hmm. the Trump era in Washington, also a sad thing. Um, but I think there's also some honor, at least, in a disciplined service in trying your best within a system. But your obligation is to be honest, even when it's not convenient. Um, but, you know, there were a lot of mistakes made in that period. I mean, many of you remember the deep shock to our system of 9-11, I think, for President George W. Bush. This created a sense of mission that hadn't existed before, a determination to ensure that the United States would never again be attacked in that way, you know, a, um, an inclination to preempt and prevent attacks. There were neoconservatives in the administration who were far more ambitious and who saw the toppling of Saddam Hussein as the key to planting the seeds of democracy in the Middle East, another idea that you know, was not tethered to history as I understood in the Middle East. And then there were kind of the paleo-conservatives, what I always associated with Vice President Cheney and Secretary Rumsfeld, whose view was not as ambitious as the neoconservatives, but focused more on just demonstrating forcefully, beyond the demonstration in Afghanistan after 9-11, that you didn't want to mess with the United States. And Saddam Hussein was a tempting target for that. But, you know, the 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 differences within the administration, especially between the State Department and the Pentagon and the Vice President's office, tended to be papered over. Mm -hmm. There were kind of parallel processes which didn't really intersect for thinking about the day after. Um, and then you had, you know, you had a process that just didn't work. You, you never had, a, as far as I recall, a single meeting which made a decision to go to war. You never had a single meeting which made those fateful decisions to disband the Iraqi military and to basically prevent people who had been Ba'ath Party members from public service again in Iraq or basically from employment. And the truth was there were a lot of people who became members of the Ba'ath Party so that they could be school teachers. I mean, it was in some ways like communists in the old Soviet Union. So those were, you know, really misguided choices that were made, but there was no sort of thoughtful process to consider the pros and cons of that. You write in the book as well that during the Iraq War, the Arab-Israeli peace process really became secondary and was pushed to the side because we were so focused on Iraq. Mm -hmm. You also tell some incredible stories about your time with so many uh, Israeli leaders and Palestinians as well. I, I'm, I remember you writing that Ariel Sharon used to greet you by saying you're mostly welcome, which you did not think was actually a language barrier and that he did it on purpose. How, <laughs> how, perhaps. How much of your experience working on this issue, which is still ongoing today, obviously, was dependent on the leaders that were involved, that were at the table, from the highs of the Madrid conference to the second intifada right. and where we are today? Our leadership matters, you know, matters enormously, and nowhere is that more important than the Middle East. You look at the kind of what-if questions. If Sadat hadn't been assassinated, if Yitzhak Rabin had not been assassinated, Israel's prime minister at the end of 1995, you know, if, if, you know, Secretary Baker had been secretary for another term, I mean, I remember Baker in organizing the Madrid Peace Conference after the Gulf War, which, you know, in retrospect, since we're all so much smarter after we leave government, um, you know, looks like it was foreordained. But at the time, it didn't look like that was inevitable. And Baker was an enormously 
skilled diplomat, but also incredibly persistent. I remember one illustration, which isn't exactly an example of high diplomacy of persistence and stamina with Secretary Baker. Um, one of his meetings with Hafez al-Assad, who was the then bloody dictator of Syria, the father of the current bloody dictator of Syria, um, took nine hours straight. It was one of the longest single meetings I had ever been a part of. Um, and Hafez al-Assad, um, I always thought had a surgically improved bladder because he would stand, he would sit literally motionless for hour after hour and drink endless cups of sweet Arabic tea. The baker, ever the competitive Texan, was determined not to move and to match him <laughs> cup for cup. About four hours into this nine hour meeting, our ambassador in Damascus, a wonderful diplomat, cracked and invented an excuse about an urgent phone call he had to make. He, he had urgent business, but it was not it a wasn't phone call. That. And so the, it helped break the ice between Assad and Baker, because then they spent the next 45 minutes you know, uh, criticizing bladder-challenged American <laughs> diplomats. So stamina is important in diplomacy, too. But, but leadership makes an enormous difference. And it's rare that you see the stars in alignment in the Middle East, where you have leaders Arabs, Israelis, Palestinians, as well as you know, what at least until recently has been the principal external player on those issues, the United States. Leaders who all at the same time shared a sense of vision, a willingness to take some calculated risks. That's been pretty rare. And final question for me, and then we'll open it up. Crown, I think then Crown Prince Abdullah mm -hmm. of Saudi Arabia told you that Americans tend to be energetic but slow-witted students, which I- I think he was just talking about me. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. How right is that? I think I know your answer to that. And based upon that, from all of your years of experience, what would be your guidance to diplomats today? What's the most important thing that they can do as they represent our country overseas? Well, I mean, I think for diplomats, and you know, we're blessed today that as we're talking here, there are lots of American diplomats doing hard jobs in hard places around the world, um, and they're doing the very best that they can. You know, I think for American diplomats, given the fact that even if we're not the singular dominant player in the landscape anymore, we still have a better hand to play than anybody else. Humility is a good starting point. Um, you know, I've always thought the power of our example overseas matters more than the power of our preaching. Americans, me included, can be a little bit patronizing sometimes. It doesn't go over well with people. So, you know, I think understanding the virtue of style and tone makes a difference. You have to understand your own society. Um, I think sometimes American diplomats fall into the trap of understanding foreign landscapes better than their own. Fine Titus. Yeah, and, and you have to understand too, there's a pretty big disconnect in our own society right now that, that Donald Trump didn't invent. I mean, the disconnect between people like me, you know, card-carrying members of the Washington establishment, and lots of American citizens who, when we preach the virtues of you know, disciplined American leadership, don't need to be convinced so much about American leadership or American engagement in the world, but they're a little skeptical about the disciplined part because they see too much evidence of American overreach, Iraq 2003, in a, in a different way, the hubris of the global financial crisis um, a few years later. Um, and, and so we need to work harder as diplomats, I think, to both recognize that disconnect and to try to narrow it a little bit mm -hmm. too. You know, we all tell ourselves, we used to tell ourselves in the State Department that smart American foreign policy begins at home in a strong political and economic system. And of course that's true. But we have to do a better job of helping to illustrate for American citizens that it ends there too, in better jobs and better security and a healthier environment as well. And, you know, so I think for diplomats of you know, the next generation, being aware of that and trying to connect more with their own society is really important. And then the last thing I'd say, well, two last things. You know, you can't kid yourself that talking for the sake of talking is gonna get you very far. And a lot of the examples we've just been talking about, it's about harnessing leverage, military and economic leverage, American power. Again, not as an end in itself, but, it, but harnessed to realistic aims. And last but not least, I think it's really important for American diplomats not to check their values at the door. Even in dealing with the most complicated partners in the world, authoritarian you know, regimes of one kind or another. And I would not argue that I got that balance right over the years of my career. You know, American administrations of both parties have not exactly had a pristine record. 
But you know, I think when we indulge authoritarian states, um, I don't think that serves our interests over the long term. And it doesn't really serve the interests of those societies either, because they inevitably become more brittle partners when they don't address the fundamental indignities in their own society as well. So imperfect as our approach almost inevitably is, I think it's really important to make sure that you know, we're focused on values and that sense of enlightened self-interest, which has animated you know, American foreign policy at, my, at its best in my experience. And what I'm afraid of today is that instead of enlightened interest, you have a lot more focus on the self part than the enlightened mm -hmm. part. One last question. If you could redo, if you could have back any job that you had at the State Department, which one would it be? To have it back? You mean yeah. what I did in that job yeah. or the job itself? Oh, it, I mean, when I ran the Middle East Bureau mm -hmm. of the State Department and the run up to Iraq in 2003, I think, you know, we as a nation made a, a huge mistake there. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wish I had been more effective in conveying my concerns about that at the time. Thank you. My pleasure. We'll open it up to questions now. Hi, my name is Ari. I'm a master's Hi. student in international relations. Um, the decline of the State Department is often described in binary terms. This is kind of Secretary yeah. Matters, Matters. You either give the state more money right. or you buy me more bullets. But as you started, it's not that way. They should, it's not either or. They should be used in conjunction. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you can speak to not how do we get a more fully funded and resurgent State Department, but assuming that, yep. how do we get a State Department that is a full-fledged player in the interagency process? And how do we get a foreign policy that uses diplomacy alongside all these other tools? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think you need at least three things. Um, the first is a political leadership, which you know embraces the notion of balance across all the tools of American foreign policy. Diplomacy is just one of them. You have to have a strong military. You need a healthy economy. You need the power of our example, which isn't a particularly great one today. Um, but diplomacy ought to be your tool of first resort. So you need a political leadership that embraces that philosophy, I think, and that also looks for a balance in how we devote our budgetary resources too. You know, the Trump, the Trump White House proposed about three weeks ago for the third year in a row historic cuts in the budget, not just for the State Department, but for U.S. development assistance as well. So the proposal was for $40 billion for both diplomacy and development, which is a lot of money and $750 billion for the Pentagon for the US military. You need a strong military. There's always going to be an imbalance, but that's 19 times higher, and I think that's a foolish imbalance. So that's point one. Point two really has to do with the State Department itself, and this is self-criticism. There's lots of things you can do to make the State Department um, a more agile player if, if you want to be recognized as a more serious player in the national security system, and I'm sure Sam can add a lot to this, but you know, the State Department oftentimes gets in its own way. You know, individual American diplomats can be incredibly courageous, innovative, entrepreneurial. As an institution, the State Department is rarely accused of being too agile or too full <laughs> of initiative. Um, and so there are things we can do in the State Department to delayer, to make ourselves you know, a little bit more nimble, and that's the best way to make the argument for more resources from the Congress and to a president and a White House about a better balance amongst tools. We also have to build modern skills on top of that base, too. I mean, you know, the State Department, if it's going to play a role in helping to develop, you know, workable international rules of the road on the revolution and technology, which is going to transform everything about our economy, about our society, about international relations whether it's artificial intelligence or synthetic biology, we're going to need to attract people who are far more conversant than my generation ever was in those skills. And we're going to have to be more flexible in order to do that. We're going to have to have people come in at a sort of middle level, sometimes come in just for a few years as, a, as opposed to a whole career. The same thing with regard to climate change, the same thing with regard to the increasing importance of economic issues in traditional national security statecraft. And then the, the third point is really what I made before about you know, a more concerted effort to reduce that disconnect in our own society about the importance of American leadership and the importance of diplomacy overseas. So I'm, I'm, it's not an impossible task. It's not easy in this day and age. The State Department doesn't have a natural constituency you know, amongst American voters. But it's an argument that I think can be an effective one.
thank you so much for coming. My name's sure. Alexia. I'm a fourth year political science major. So that kind of dovetails into my question about what your thoughts are on the long-term impacts of projection of American power and ability to work in back through back channels of kind of the recent hollowing out of the State Department. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have ambassadors to a lot of important posts. Some of them have only recently been filled. Um, a lot of kind of mid and higher tier officials have resigned, as you mentioned. So kind of what do you think are the long-term impacts as a result? Well, I mean, I think it's going to take a lot longer to fix than it's taken to break is the problem. It's true of any institution. And I do think there's a, a serious hollowing out right now of the State Department, um, which is going to cause real problems for us over time. I think you know there's a dismissiveness, not just toward diplomatic service, but public service in general that you hear from the White House. You know, when you know, there's a huge number of senior vacancies, as you said, in the State Department. You know, there are six regional bureaus in the State Department. That's how the State Department divides up the world, each led by an assistant secretary. Two and a half years into this administration, only two of those six are permanent assistant secretaries confirmed by the US Senate. And a number of important embassies overseas that are vacant, at least don't have you know, um, ambassadors right now. When President Trump was asked a little more than a year ago about whether he was concerned about all those senior vacancies, he said, no, not really, because I'm the only one who matters. That's diplomacy as an exercise in narcissism. That's not the diplomacy I was describing before you know, that I learned in Baker's time at the State Department, too. So the first, the first challenge, I think, is to appreciate what's at stake, because I really do believe, as I said before, diplomacy matters more cold-bloodedly to promoting American interests in a new era on the international landscape than it has any time in my recollection before. And yet diplomacy today is also more adrift than I've seen it before, too. So you know, that, that's why you need a, a real serious effort at renewal. Hi, I'm Eric Sullivan. I'm a fourth year in the medical school. Hi. Um, so there's been a lot written about uh, kind of the depreciation of multilateralism in terms of like people not really approving it and that playing into people like Donald Trump and the interest in Brexit and mm -hmm. things like that. And I'm wondering what your uh, thoughts are on whether there's a failure of messaging or substance in terms of convincing large portions of the population, both in the US and in Europe, um, that multilateralism is good for them and the world? Well, I mean, part of it, to be honest, um, is, is a sense on the part of lots of Americans, again, which President Trump didn't invent, that you know we've been taken for suckers in some of our alliance relationships, that allies have taken advantage, that some NATO allies are not paying their fair share. And there's some truth to that. President Trump's not the first American president to make that criticism. So, you know, I, I've never taken issue with President Trump's effort to push some NATO partners to pay more, nor did I take issue with his effort to this day to push the Chinese on predatory trade and investment practices. So there's a need to reform international institutions, um, as well as some of our alliances. I mean, that's what makes multilateralism. Um, but I think the problem is th the context in which we're doing it. I mean, I think the president embraces a kind of muscular unilateralism, which looks at the United States on this international landscape as if we're kind of Gulliver tied down by the Lilliputians. And if we could just throw off the bonds of alliances and coalitions and international institutions, we're better able to promote our interests and drive hard transactional bargains. I think that turns today's reality on its head. As I said before, we're no longer the only big kid on the geopolitical block. It's a more crowded, contested, competitive environment. Our capacity to draw on alliances, to adapt institutions, um, is what sets us apart from a lot of other major powers today. And we ought to draw on that capacity. And we have a window before us within which we can smartly try to adapt those institutions of multilateralism, um, adapt alliances, uh, and help reshape you know, an international order to fit this world um, before it gets reshaped for us by the rise of other powers and, and you know, other events. That window's not going to stay open forever. And so that's what I worry about uh, in our sort of dismissiveness toward the virtues of alliances and international institutions. Hi, uh, my hey. name is Young, uh, third year in sociology. 
So my question is about uh, qualification and sensibility in diploma diplomacy. Mm -hmm. So what sort of uh, sensibility or set of skills that are uniquely suited for ambassadors working in uh, countries with relatively more adversarial relationships, yeah. such as Russia, as opposed to those working in countries with more friendly and even allies, such as Japan or South Korea. Right. And what role diplomats could play as individuals to address or alleviate some anti-Americanisms in mm. some parts of those countries? Hmm. It's a good question. I mean, you know, the, if you look at American ambassadors overseas, about 70% of them are professional diplomats, people like me, and 30% on average, administration after administration, are political appointees. Oftentimes, people who come with, you know, really important skill sets. Um, so you can have some really competent political appointee ambassadors. Um, and, you know, sometimes you can have professional diplomats who fall short as well. Um, typically, though, in the places you were describing, um, you, you know, you don't see political appointees, um, you know, long lines of them trying to go to places in the Middle East or, you know, other parts of the world. We have oftentimes adversarial relationships as well. I think the skills are the ones we were talking about before. I, I do think humility, and here by that I don't mean shyness about asserting American power. You got to be pretty hard nosed in dealing with you know, adversarial governments like Putin's Russia, um, you know, those are leaders who aren't going to respect efforts to ingratiate yourself with them, as I was describing before. But, you know, it, it helps to set a tone at least of respect, even if we're pretty clear about our differences and our willingness to push back against other powers. Um, you have to have you have to be able to demonstrate that you can speak authoritatively. In other words, you're connected enough, not just to a Secretary of State, but to a President and a White House, that people won't doubt that you're speaking for them. That was one of the great secrets of Baker's influence in the world when he worked for President Bush 41, because they had been close, if not best friends, for decades before they had those jobs. So that becomes important as well. Language capabilities matter. Even though there are lots of people in the world today who speak English, it's a matter of pride, you know, in Moscow or in lots of other capitals to be able to conduct business in Russian in that instance, too. And so, you know, being able to train people in not only languages, but also history, culture, so they can navigate those societies is really important, too. Some people have talked about a new Cold War between systems of freedom or systems of uh, autocracy, yeah. uh, or maybe just a contest over what the principles of a new world order would be. Is it going to be an order safe for autocracy? Mm. Uh, at the beginning tonight, you said that we're on the brink of another transformative moment, like 1945 and 19. 89, yes. so I wonder exactly what you had in mind. Maybe sure. it's something entirely different from that. No, I mean, I think that's a very important part of it, too. I mean, part of this is about geopolitics, as I said. You know, compared to the world of 1989, the Soviet Union about to collapse, when the United States was the singular dominant player on the landscape, there's competition today with the rise of China, the resurgence of Russia on a slower trajectory, India, over the next few decades. So geopolitically, power is more diffuse today. You have these huge overarching challenges of climate, the biggest existential threat out there, um, as well as the revolution in technology. And then also, I would add just what you said, and that's a competition, a renewed competition in ideas. You know, in 1989, when I was working for Baker, you know, there was this broad assumption that all the trend lines were running in the direction of an American model, open political and economic systems. It was the height of globalization euphoria. Today, it's clear that there's real competition between democratic systems, many of us facing all sorts of internal contradictions and inequalities and pressures, and authoritarian systems that you know, may vary one model to the next, but all feel the wind in their sails right now, too. And so, you know, the way in which, so you have to recognize, I think, you know, the profound transformations that are afoot on that landscape, and especially that competition in ideas. And, you know, that, that involves first getting our own house in order, because democratic systems face real challenges. I was in uh, Britain two weeks ago, I guess, and, you know, we're having nervous breakdowns on both sides of the Atlantic right now, too. So it's reviving our own political and economic systems. Second, it's recognizing that a lot of authoritarian systems have 
huge numbers of contradictions inside them right now. And I mentioned Russia before. There's a middle class emerging in Russia, which is restive today. It's not revolutionary. But you know, over time, I think people are going to become increasingly uneasy when their standards of living aren't improving and the economy is more or less stagnant right now because it's so one dimensional. China's got lots of, for all of its emerging strengths, lots of contradictions as well. So as democratic systems, we ought not to feel um, intimidated. We ought to feel a sense of confidence. But we do have to get our own act together first. And then I think we need to look for ways, it gets back to the multilateralism point, where we can make common cause you know, with, with other political systems, democratic systems, who share a broad interest, at least, in dealing with the revolution in technology, coming up with international rules of the road. Because ultimately, that's what gives us leverage in dealing with at least some of those authoritarian players. Hi again. Um, hey. until, until recently, uh, we used to hear a lot about America as an indispensable nation. I'm yeah. wondering whether you think American leadership on the world stage is indispensable, and I guess more broadly, just what you think America's role can and should look like in the 21st century. Well, the indispensable adjective, I think, sometimes gets us in trouble a little bit, too, because you know it implies this image that we're like the Dutch boy putting his fingers in the dike. You know, we're the only player who can deal with all those challenges out there. And the, the truth is, you know, there may have been a moment when our power was unparalleled when that description fit. I'm not so sure it does today. What I do believe, though, and I don't mean this as a statement of American arrogance at all, but I do think we have a better hand to play than any of our major rivals. I do think on most of the big issues we've been talking about, without you know, um, a sustained sense of American leadership, not that we have the capacity to solve all these problems, but we do have, I think, still a unique capacity to mobilize coalitions of countries to deal with them. It's hard to see how you make sustained progress. So, you know, you look at our withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement, you know, that, even though there are lots of countries in the world who are trying to come to grips with the challenge of climate change, there are US states and governors and mayors who are trying to do the same thing. When the United States abdicates on an issue like that, it makes it a lot harder to deal with the urgency of that issue of global warming. Um, and so that's just, that's just one example where I think American leadership is crucial. As I said, I shy away a little bit from the indispensable part. But I, I do think the United States, to answer your last question about what our role is on this landscape in the midst of profound transformation, if we're not the indispensable power, if we're no longer the single dominant power, we still are the pivotal power in the sense that we can use our leverage to mobilize coalitions of countries, draw on alliances on international institutions to help deal with lots of the biggest challenges out there in a way that no other country can. But we have to be careful about matching ends to means, about not overreaching in the ways we've done before, because that's the surest way to let that disconnect you know, between Washington leadership and lots of other Americans to just widen to the point where it breaks all together. Good evening. Thank Hi. you so much for being here. Sure. My name is Annalise. I'm a master's student at the Harris School of Public Policy. Um, so the uh, Russian attack on the 2016 election, um, there can be a strong case can be made that the goal or at least the effect of the attack was to undermine faith in democracy and the security mm -hmm. of our election systems. So how do you think that that affects uh, the global view of democracy as an effective form of government and um, sort of that in that competition of ideas you were mentioning between democracy and authoritarianism, the ability of people to have faith that democracy would be a right. better choice uh, because... It, I mean, it, it's a really good question. The short answer is it undermines it, which was exactly part of the purpose of Vladimir Putin and, you know, trying to interfere in our elections. I think he was... He aimed, you know, he's an apostle of payback in my experience. So this was partly about getting even against the backdrop of what I was trying to describe before. It was partly about sowing chaos in the American political system. He didn't invent our polarization or dysfunction, but he wanted to take advantage of it. And it was partly just as you suggested to expose what he always argues is the hypocrisy of the American system. The democratic systems in his argument are just as corrupt as authoritarian systems. We just talk a different game. Um, you know, and in that sense, I think he's had a fair amount of success in doing that. 
And the, 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 the problem, like the old cartoon, is in some ways us. You know, it's whether we get our act together in the face of that. Um, obviously, we have to push back against him and do everything we can to ensure that that doesn't happen again. But a lot of those challenges, you know, beginning to reduce that dysfunction and polarization have to do a lot more with us than they do with him or any other outside player. Hi. Hi, my name is Sophia. I'm a student at the college studying political science and Russian East European studies. Um, I was wondering what, in your opinion, is the biggest threat facing American diplomacy today, either internally or externally, and what do you see as our best method of combating this? It's another good question. I mean, I think in some ways, just to pick up on the last question, the biggest threat is us. You know, I mean, the United States has enormous resources um, and a lot of influence on the international landscape. But, but we just have to recognize, you know, where we're kind of falling short in how we invest in the different instruments of national security policy, too. And so in that sense, I think if we can reverse some of that, um, you know, we still have, you know, an enormous capacity to influence events overseas if we're careful about it. I mean, there are lots of challenges. If you look at what, that's the internal challenge. Externally, I mean, the biggest existential threat is climate change, as I said before, in my view. China's emergence is the biggest single geopolitical challenge out there. That's the biggest test of American diplomacy and statecraft in a way. Um, you know, our ability to help shape a relationship that's gonna matter more than any other single relationship in the world that's inevitably gonna be a combination of competition and sometimes political and economic confrontation and cooperation in other areas. Um, that's, that's gonna be a really big test. Um, and that's gonna require not just this administration, but its successors um, to focus a lot of diplomatic effort on that. Thank you so much. Sure. Hi. Hi. I was in the college here many years ago. Oh, it's nice and to see I'd you. What I'd like to ask you about is Venezuela. Yes. And they, they apparently the challenger has launched his, um, his revolt mm -hmm. and uh, it was reported that today the president was actually ready to fly to Havana and the Russians called him and told him not to, mm. and he didn't. What is your view of the situation in Venezuela? Well, I mean, I think first, you know, Venezuelans would be a lot better off without the Maduro government um, and the Chavez government before Maduro. I think they've, you know, essentially ruined what was potentially a quite prosperous society. Having said that, I think what the administration has done so far which is to work with lots of other countries. This is a little bit counter to type from what we were talking about over the last two and a half years, but it's a good thing to work with partners in Latin America, as well as the European Union and others, to build political and economic pressure to help Venezuelans produce a change um, in leadership. Uh, I think that's a sensible thing to do. I think the two cautionary notes, at least in my view as a recovering diplomat, would be first, I'd be really careful about the temptation to use US force. Given the history of American military involvement in Latin America, I think that would cause far more problems than it would solve. So I hope people are being careful about that temptation. And second, comes back to some of the things we were talking about before, I hope people are thinking carefully about the day after. You know, if you assume that Venezuelans are successful in changing leadership, um, and that the Maduro government goes, hopefully with as little violence as possible, then the question is what comes next? And if you have a situation where the military and the security forces have all disintegrated or collapsed, you know, as we've seen in a number of instances before, not just in Iraq after 2003, but in Libya, you know, in more recent years after Gaddafi's toppling, you can have a huge challenge of order and basic security. And the clear lesson of recent history is without that, it's very difficult to put back together a healthy political system, let alone a healthy economy, too. So I hope people are thinking about that as well. But the basic approach you know, of building political and economic pressure, working with a coalition of countries, and within international institutions, I think is a pretty healthy one, too. I just hope that there's a you know, relatively rapid and uh, conclusion with as little violence as possible. Ambassador, thank you. This My certainly made, made me miss, miss government even more. Thank <laughs> yeah. you for all that you do and for the book. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Thank you all very much. <laughs>